the blood oozing over his hands, which twitched with every hammer blow. And he suffered all this for love. In 1633, the convent of Ursulines in Loudun, France, became the scene of an outbreak of what was described as diabolical possession. Many of the nuns sequestered in the convent showed all the signs of possession, including speaking in tongues, convulsive fits. That's not all. The nuns barked, screamed blasphemies, and acted out obscene contortions. The affair grew in volume until practically all the nuns belonging to the institution were in the same condition. A total of 27 nuns claimed to be possessed, obsessed or bewitched. The exorcisms became a popular public spectacle conducted at the Ursuline convent. Though the whole affair had blown over by 1634, with the execution of the main protagonist, exorcisms continued until 1637. The Ursuline convent was opened in Loudun in 1626. In 1632, prioress Jean d'Ange presided over 17 nuns, whose average age was 25, most of them noble birth. They were not particularly pious, but were sent to the convent because their families could not afford dowries large enough to attract suitors of a suitable class to their own. The first reports of alleged demonic possession began about five months after the outbreak of plague in 1632, as it was winding down. While doctors and wealthy property owners had left town, the doctors because there was nothing they could do, others attempted to isolate themselves. The nuns had shut themselves behind walls and discontinued receiving any outside visitors. Most were resigned to their fate and lived in a purgatory of boredom inside the cold walls. Their quarters were gloomy and it was rumoured to be haunted. There was no furniture and the nuns would sleep on the floor. They did menial work and did not partake of meat. In 1627, a new superior was appointed, Jean de Ange, formerly Jean de Belciel, a baron's daughter. Contemporaries of Jean d'Ange described her as showing outwardly the qualities of a saint, but the saintly facade hid a strange, ambitious woman. She was arrogant, mean, and extravagant in her secular life. She had been entered into the convent because she had a hunchback and unattractive appearance, which made her marriage prospects poor. Jean nursed secret resentments, she feigned piety in order to become a mother superior. Let us introduce now Eubain Grandier. In 1617, Grandier was appointed parish priest of saint pierre du marche in Loudon, a town in Poitiers, France. He cut quite a figure, handsome, urbane, wealthy and eloquent. 
This pleasing combination made the priest a target for the attention of girls in Ludon. Although Yubain was charming and eloquent to those who fell easily under his spell, his arrogance, though, made enemies in high places. He was rumored to enjoy the favors of rich widows. He inspired admiration and adoration, and at the same time resentment and envy. Everything he did was successful, and he enjoyed the support of powerful people. The neighboring clergy were jealous of Grandia, because he had obtained two benefices in their diocese of which he was not a native, and they made up their minds to destroy him at the first possible opportunity. Grandia's favoured status did not last. Part of his persona was a predilection for philandering. A pivotal event contributing to Grandia's downfall was the seduction of Felipe, the daughter of the prominent Louis Trincon, a king's prosecutor in Loudon and one of Grandia's staunchest friends and supporters. Although it cannot be proven, it is likely that Felipe was impregnated by Grandia. After Felipe became pregnant, Grandier's life began to unravel. Grandier reveled in his popularity and often acted arrogantly. He quarreled with people and did not care whether or not they became enemies. He openly courted Madeleine de Bru, a daughter of the king's counsellor, to whom he composed a treatise against the celibacy of priests. Most assumed Madeleine was Grandier's mistress. If you care to read every law in the New Testament, you won't find anywhere that it's forbidden to marry. In fact, marriage is exalted so high, it becomes a sacrament, doesn't it? Virginity is also praised as a noble virtue. St. Paul says that he who marries does a good thing, but he who remains chaste does something better. Around 1629, Jacques de Thibault, said to be a relative of Felipe, was quite vocal in expressing his opinion of Grandier's conduct with women. When Grandia demanded an explanation, Thibault beat him with a cane outside the church of Saint-Croix. In the course of the resulting trial, Thibault raised certain charges in his defence, causing the magistrates to turn the case over to the ecclesiastical court. The bishop then prohibited Grandia from performing any public functions as a priest for five years in the Diocese of Poitiers and forever in Loudon. Grandier appealed to the court at Poitiers. As a number of witnesses retracted their statements, the case was dismissed. Grandier was also a very well-connected man, high in political circles. It was these connections that helped restore him to full clerical duties within the same year. Grandier's enemies approached Father Mignon in their determination to destroy the hated priest. Mignon was confessor to the Ursuline nuns at their convent and a relative of Trincon, whose daughter had been seduced. The plan was for Father Mignon to persuade a few of the sisters to feign possession, swearing that Father Grandier had bewitched them. The mother superior, Jean d'Ange, and another nun readily complied. Jean became sexually obsessed with Grandier, 
and had strange dreams in which he appeared to her as a radiant angel, but spoke more as a devil would, enticing her to sexual acts and vices. Her sexually spiced hysterical dreams and ravings disturbed the peace of the convent, and despite flagellation and penance, soon more nuns had succumbed to similar hallucinations and dreams. Jean d'Ange has been described as strong-willed, manipulative, highly strung, and a brilliant actor in the parts she designed for herself. When she set out to assume a particular character, whether one of great charity, great learning, great mysticism, or even great possession, others would follow. It is not difficult to imagine how prioress Jean's powerful position in the convent combined with her charismatic role-playing, might have persuaded the other nuns of their own possession. One young nun said that she had a vision of her recently deceased confessor, Father Mousson. In late December 1632, the nuns began to see strange visions around the convent. Before many days had passed, these solidified into the spectral shape of Eubain Grandier, stalking the corridors of the nunnery at night. Gradually, more and more of the nuns began to go into convulsions and to speak with strange voices. Nicolas Aubin, a Protestant pastor in Laudun, wrote in his published account of the affair that the nuns struck their chests and backs with their heads, as if they had their necks broken, and with inconceivable rapidity. They twisted their arms at the joints of the shoulder, the elbow, or the wrist, two or three times around. Lying on their stomachs, they joined the palms of their hands to the soles of their feet, their faces became so frightful one could not bear to look at them. Their eyes remained open without winking. Their tongues issued suddenly from their mouths, horribly swollen, black, hard, and covered with pimples. And yet, while in this state, they spoke distinctly. They threw themselves back till their heads touched their feet and walked in this position with wonderful rapidity and for a long time. They uttered cries so horrible and so loud that nothing like it was ever heard before. They made use of expressions so indecent as to shame the most debauched of men, while their acts, both in exposing themselves and inviting lewd behavior from those present, would have astonished the inmates of the lowest brothels of the country. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedictus Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedictus 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 tecum, When word circulated that the Ursuline nuns were bewitched and possessed, and Grandier was responsible, the priest ignored the gossip. It must be a foolish mistake, for didn't the revised Witchcraft Act of 1604 call for the death penalty upon conviction of sorcery, witchcraft and diabolical pact? It was nonsense to think he, Grandier, 
would be part of such evil. The development of sorcery accusations against Grandier had grave implications. Eubain Grandier was a libertine who deflowered virgins and, for all his sharp wit, was rather foolish. But it seems highly unlikely that he was any kind of sorcerer or necromancer. Demonic possession in that era was not the field of the medical practitioner who might ascribe the nun's behaviour to neurosis because of sexual abstinence. Only very few rural physicians were prepared to speak out against the church on the subject of demonic phenomena. Their more astute medical colleagues knew better than to challenge such agents like Richelieu and the Baron de la Baudemont, two of whose sisters-in-law belonged to the convent. Father Mignon and Father Pierre Barret began the ritual of exorcising the nuns. Jean and the others shrieked, cavorted and suffered convulsive fits. Whether the rituals added to the performance or caused Jean's mind to snap, she swore that she and the others were possessed by two demons, Asmodeus and Zabulon, sent by Father Grandier via a bouquet of roses thrown over the convent walls. When the demons were questioned according to the form prescribed by the ritual as to why they had entered the bodies of the nuns, the replies growled it was from hatred. But when being questioned as to the name of the magician who summoned them, they answered that it was Eubain Grandia. The interrogation was repeated several times and always received the same reply. Excerpt from The Devils of Lodun, 1888 As regard the nuns, they deposed that Grandier had introduced himself into the convent by day and night for four months, without anyone knowing how he got in, that he presented himself to them while standing at divine service and tempted them to indecent actions, both by word and deed, that they were often struck by invisible persons, and that the marks of the blows were so visible that the doctors and surgeons had easily found them, and that the beginning of all these troubles was signalized by the apparition of Prior Mousson, their first confessor. The Mother Superior and seven or eight other nuns, when confronted with Grandier, identified him, although it was ascertained that they had never seen him save by magic and that he had never had anything to do with their affairs. The two women formerly mentioned and the two priests maintained the truth of their evidence. In a word, besides the nuns and six laywomen, sixty witnesses deposed to adulteries, incests, sacrileges and other crimes committed by the accused even in the most secret places of his church, as in the vestry where the holy host was kept on all days and at all hours. The blood oozing over his hands, which twitched with every hammer blow. <coughs> and he suffered all this for love. A knowledge of unknown tongues first showed itself in the Mother Superior. At the beginning, she answered in Latin the questions of the exorcism ritual presented to her in that language. Later, she and others answered in different languages. Monsieur de Launay de Razzilli, who had lived in America, attested that, during a visit to Lodun, he had spoken to them in the language of a certain savage tribe of that country, and that they had answered quite correctly, and had revealed to him events that had taken place there. 
some gentlemen of Normandy certified in writing that they had questioned Sister Clara de Tzatzili in Turkish, Spanish and Italian and that her answers were correct. Monsieur de Nisme, doctor of the Sorbonne and one of the chaplains of the Cardinal de Lyon, having questioned them in Greek and German, was satisfied with their replies in both languages. Monsieur Chiron, prior of Maillose, desiring to strengthen his belief in demonical possession, begged Monsieur de Moron to allow him to whisper to a third party the sign he required, and he thereon whispered to Monsieur de Fenaison, Canon and Provost of the same church, that he wished the nun to fetch a missal then lying near the door, and to put her finger on the first part of the Mass of the Holy Virgin, beginning Salve Sancte Parians. Monsieur de Moran, who had heard nothing, ordered Sister Clara, who was likewise ignorant of what had been said, to obey the intentions of Monsieur Chiron. This young girl then fell into strange convulsions, blaspheming, rolling on the ground, exposing her person in the most indecent manner, without a blush, and with foul and lascivious expressions and actions till she caused all who looked on to hide their eyes with shame. Though she had never seen the prior, she called him by his name and said he should be her lover. It was only after many repeated commands and an hour's struggling that she took up the missal, saying, I will pray. Then turning her eyes in another direction, she placed her finger on the first part of the mass of the Holy Virgin. The devil sometimes made them fall suddenly asleep. They fell to the ground and became so heavy that the strongest man had great trouble in even moving their heads. Sister Frangua Philistro, having her mouth closed, one could hear within her body different voices speaking at the same time, quarreling and discussing who should make her speak. The mother superior was known at this time to levitate and once remained suspended in the air at the height of 24 inches. Other nuns, when comatose, became pliable like a thin piece of lead, so that their body could be bent in every direction, forward, backward or sideways, till their head touched the ground, and they remained in these positions for lengthy periods. In addition to the dreams that Jean d'Ange and other nuns had related, Jean added a third demon to the array of possessors afflicting the nuns, Isakaron, the devil of debauchery. After admitting to this third demon possessor, Jean went through a psychosomatic pregnancy. In all, Jean and the other nuns claimed to be possessed by a multitude of demons. On June the 23rd, 1634, the Bishop of Poitiers, and Monsieur de Le Bordemont being present, Grandier was brought from his prison to the church of Saint-Croix in his parish, to be present at the exorcisms. All the possessed were there likewise. As the accused and his partisans declared that the possessions were mere impostures, he was ordered to be himself the exorcist, and the stole was presented to him. He could not refuse, and therefore, taking the stole and the ritual, he received the pastoral benediction, and after the Veni Creator had been sung, commenced the exorcism in the usual form. In an effort to clear his name, Father Grandier spoke to the nuns in Greek, testing their knowledge of languages previously unknown to them, 
a sure sign of possession. The nuns had been carefully coached and responded that they had been ordered in their pact to never use Greek. In December 1633, Father Grandier was put in prison at the castle of Angers. A search for devil's marks was made by the inquisitors. Protest by Dr. Fourneau, the doctor who prepared Grandier for torture, and the apothecary from Poitiers were ignored. These protests claimed the inspection was a hoax, and stated that no such marks had been found. They sent for Manuri, the surgeon, one of Grandier's enemies, and the most unmerciful of them all. Grandier was stripped naked and blindfolded. Every part of his body was shaved. When Manuri wanted to persuade the witnesses that the parts of Grandier's body, which had been marked by the devil, were insensible, he turned that end of the probe which was round and placed it only near the prisoner's skin. The patient did not then cry out because it didn't make contact and therefore he felt no pain but when the barbarous surgeon would make them see that the other parts of his body were very sensitive, he turned the probe at the other end, which was very sharp pointed, and thrust it to the very bone, and then the witnesses heard screams and cries so piercing that they were shaken to the core. People began to speak out in Grandier's defense. Even some of the possessed nuns proclaimed his innocence. Sister Claire said tearfully that her possession and the accusations against Grandier were all lies, and that she had been forced to denounce Grandier by Mignon, Lactance, and the Carmelites. Jean attempted to escape the convent, but was captured and returned. These confessions were quickly explained away as the nuns being used by Satan to save Grandier. Jean d'Ange appeared in court with a noose tied around her neck, violently stating that she would hang herself if she could not recant her earlier lies. All defences were ignored, and some defence witnesses were pressured to keep silent. Publicly, Lobardemont announced that any citizens who testified in favour of Grandier would be arrested as traitors to the king, and have their possessions confiscated. Many of these witnesses fled France. Nearly a year later, on August the 18th, 1634, the Royal Commission found Grandier guilty of all counts against him, and passed sentence. Grandier would be burned alive at the stake. The sentence was carried out in 1634, though only after he had been so severely tortured 
that the marrow of his bones oozed through his broken limbs. Through it all, he persistently maintained his innocence. Father Grandier was promised that he would have the chance to speak before he was executed, to be able to make a last statement, and that he would be mercifully strangled before the burning. From the scaffold, Grandier attempted to address the crowd, but the monks threw large quantities of holy water in his face, so that his last words could not be heard. The garrote was specially knotted so that it could not be tightened. He was quickly pushed into the flames, and his last statement was his screams as he was burned alive. Just before Grandier perished, he managed to hoarsely whisper to Father Lactance that he himself would see God in thirty days. Lactance died soon after, crying out in his last breath, Grandier, I was not responsible for your death. Father Tranquille, another tormentor of Grandier, died insane within five years. And Dr. Manuri, the fraudulent witch pricker, also died in delirium. Father Barre left Loudon for an exorcism at Chinon, where he was finally banished from the church for conspiring to accuse a priest of rape on the altar. The bloodstains turned out to be from a chicken. Louis Chavet, one of the judges who was skeptical of the possessions and who was denounced by Jean as a sorcerer himself, fell into depression and insanity and died before the end of the winter. In a bizarre epilogue, Jean d'Arge, the contorting, sexually neurotic nun, was afterwards considered saintly by many. After her death, her head was preserved in a reliquary and venerated. She became renowned for the healing power of her chemise and the miraculous markings which appeared on her hand bearing the names of Jesus, Joseph, Mary and also of a popular saint in that era. Later, historians would prove that a note which Jean claimed was written by a demon was actually written in her own hand. Jean d'Ange remained convinced of her own saintliness until she died peacefully in 1665, aged 63.
Well, my friends, I hope you enjoyed that presentation. What a terrible end for Eubain Grandier, the victim of unrequited love from a frustrated nun. Okay, Eubain was a dastardly and arrogant cad, but my goodness, he wasn't expecting that to happen, and I wasn't either. I think the more popular you are, the more enemies you will gain. And in his case, his enemies had equally high connections and were ruthless. At least nowadays, they find ways to denounce you, but at least you don't get tortured and have your bones crushed and then burnt at the stake. Oh my god. Yes, I think by the time Urbain realized how far this was going, I think he must have started to feel rather uneasy. The train was in motion and there was no stopping it. I think it's terrible when someone is forced into a vocation, as in the nuns, at this period in history, where obviously quite a few of them were totally not suited for the sisterhood. It's totally different if you are entering such a vocation of your own free will and you feel that it's suitable to your nature. But to be sequestered by your parents because you are not suitable marriage material must have been absolutely horrible, especially for women who were highly sexed and wanted to live a full life and not be stuck behind these horrible, cold, damp walls. And it must have been a very austere life for them. Things got out of hand. Jeanne was a very intelligent lady and was very creative with her thinking, with her theatrical abilities, and it all went too far. And it's quite obvious at the end she regretted what happened to see a man being tortured and then burnt to death because of her false confessions. Absolutely terrible. Many decades ago, I did a fill-in job at a convent, and um, it was interesting. The nuns, they were mostly elderly, and I got on very well with, with the majority of them. Most of them were very happy, very serene. It didn't seem to be... Obviously, you can't look really behind the scenes and, and know what they're thinking, but to outward appearances and their demeanor, they seemed very peaceful and happy with that decision. There was one nun, though. I really loved her. My family loved her, too. She was very high-spirited, and she was really very rebellious and going, and going totally against the, the beliefs of the order, actually. And we talked about things, and there was another nun who was shocked about what we talked about, quite outraged. That nun was uh, very close-minded. And eventually the, the little high-spirited nun had a nervous breakdown. It tells me that she was not meant for the religious life. So some people, even when they choose of their own free will, make the wrong choice. And some years back I visited a monastery here in Switzerland. Uh, it's a very ancient monastery. And the men there too seemed very happy Enjoy. Some people just want a peaceful life, and they're not. Maybe they're not highly sexed. Um, I think if if you're highly sexed, th th that sort of lifestyle is going to affect you. To repress that sexual drive is not healthy, and you can see all sorts of abuses that has happened over the ages. It's it's not, yeah, it's not normal, is it? And that's my opinion. I think most people would agree, but I think if if some men or women do not have a high sex drive and are maybe asexual, then that's a perfect life for them if you want that tranquility and meditation. And those monks at the monastery seemed very happy with their life. Actually, I was talking to one of them. He told me a funny story. While doing archaeological digs, they found in one part of the monastery where a treasurer monk had his quarters and they found that he had secreted a whole hoard of gold and silver coins which were supposed to be for the monastery's expenses. He had stashed them away for himself, probably for his escape into civilian life, and he must have died before that came to pass, and his stash remained hidden for like a 200 years. I, I love that story. Well, that's all folks. I'm going to close off now. By the way, if any of you have any problems or issues regarding the pledge, regarding viewing, or anything like that, please don't hesitate to contact me. There's a private message option, or you can either leave your comment under one of the videos, and I will reply to you. Some people have contacted me after months of having the same issue. Don't wait that long. I am here. You're not disturbing me. I will help you. You are my patron. I'm very grateful for that support, and I'm always on hand to offer help. 
99.9% of the time, I do have a solution. So don't hesitate to reach out. Anyway, my friends, I am heading off now. Until next time, you'll have to wait and see what's coming next. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye.